Yeah, so what, what I'll be talking about in the next hour is related to work that I did years ago on, um, well, on the historic period, on the uh, time in which the Spanish came into the Belize. And um, be part, partly it's because I uh, was, was part of the excavations. I didn't um, start the excavations of these churches, but I com completed them of um, a 16th century church in, at Tipu and two churches at Lamanai, 16th century Christian churches. Um, now, the Idol Rich, this is what I originally wanted to call my book, but the <laughs> publisher wouldn't let me. Uh, he didn't like it. But um, in Spanish, am I a Christians in the land that became Belize? And so I put Spanish first because we, uh, even some of my colleagues now will use the term idol when they're talking about Maya figurines. They'll say the idols, you know, and it makes me angry because the term idol means a false god. Uh, but the Spanish often interpreted any Maya imagery as a false god. But they didn't interpret their own imagery or their own figurines. So that's why I put uh, these figurines, Christian figurines, Catholic figurines. I was raised Catholic, by the way, so I figure I can criticize that. <laughs> kind of have a love-hate relationship with all of that. Um, so I, I, I expect that you thought I was going to show these as idols, but <laughs> I decided to show the others first. And these are um, various... Uh, images, statues from uh, Maya, the Maya world. Um, the head structure before, that's uh, interesting. Uh, too bad we couldn't do, do more on that, but my husband excavated that jade head. It's the size of a bowling ball, <laughs> and he excavated in a tomb at, at Alton Ha. And uh, it's supposed, originally it was said to be a sun god. Now, then it was the principal bird deity god, and now I think it's something else. But in, in essence, if the Spaniards had seen it, they would have called it idolatry. So we'll get back to that. Just in general, as a result of some of the work I did on this historic period, the Maya of Belize is kind of interesting because they were sort of caught between the evangelizing efforts of the friars and the Spanish, also the encomenderos, who were those who extracted tribute on the one hand, and then coastal predations um, by, well, they were pirates when Britain was not at war with France, but they were privateers. Is that right? Yeah, when Britain was at war with France. So depends on whether it was, sometimes the, the pirates were legal and sometimes they weren't. But there were coastal predations by British, French, Dutch, other seafarers. Uh, and it's an interesting period in Belize history that has not really been studied. I tried with one grant, didn't get it. But anyway, um, so the two sites that we'll, we'll figure in this work, work, this talk are Lamanai, which you've already heard about, and then Tipu, which you haven't heard much about, which is um, on the Macal branch of the Belize River. So it becomes a major waterway from inland to the sea. Uh, now these names here, Francisco de Montejo, um, Davila, who was Montejo's lieutenant, and Gaspar Pacheco, those names will come up. I put them here so I remember them. Okay. But they'll come up in my, and when I explain sort of what happened in Belize. Montejo was the adelantado, or the, uh, the fellow who was said to conquer Yucatan, and he became the, the adelantado, adelantado, the person in charge of, of uh, at Merida. Uh, of governance in Yucatan, and Davila was one of the men who fought with him. Uh, the Pachecos, there were two, Gaspar and uh, I think it was Alonso. Uh, they were the ones who entered Belize and uh, I, I don't want to say conquered, but they uh, killed and many of the Maya in Belize. They were re really responsible for the conquest in Belize, and it was it's said to be the worst in all of uh, conquest history. They used uh, dogs of war. Uh, they burnt people. They, oh, it's just, it's just awful. Uh, so Belize did suffer a lot at the hands of the Spanish conquistadors. Uh, okay, well, I mentioned already about Lamanai, so I don't have to explain it. Uh, Tipu is quite, 
quite near Patan, so it figured more in Spanish scenarios concerning what they wanted to do in Guatemala. It's kind of kind of interesting. Um, and I was just talking to, to someone about this. Um, the barrier reef in Belize made it really difficult to impossible for large ships to travel along the coast. They had to travel outside the reef and send small boats to explore uh, the shore. So Francisco Montejo at one time did take a ship and traveled outside the reef. He did send his lieutenant Davila in a canoe down the, the real coast of Belize. And uh, it's interesting because he hated it. <laughs> it was swampy, uh, you know, there were no beaches, and there was nothing about the coast that attracted them until they got to Honduras, where there's a very deep bay, and that they considered, you know, worth settling around. But the coast of Belize did not, did not appeal to them. And it may partly, ex you know, partly explain the ultimate Spanish disinterest in Belize. Um, so early maps show that initial reconnaissance was based on observations from the sea, as you can kind of see from here. They, you usually see landforms that you can see from the sea. Uh, here, all of rivers have been recorded. These are, are early 16th century and early 17th century maps. And Lamini actually appears on some of these. Oddly, it appears as an island on this map. Um, here it appears inland, and here it appears as an island again. So the, it's interesting that the name seems to have been uh, known in the 16th century more, more widely. As far as chronology, I'm mainly going to be talking about the time between 1501 and probably 1641. 1640s, there were uh, rebellions in Belize, and they kicked the Spanish out. And um, they never really put much energy into Belize after that. And uh, at 1700, they, they moved some communities. For example, Tipu, they moved the population to Patan. Um, but then Maya came back, back and forth, kind of interesting late history. Uh, but the big concentration of Spanish effort was between 1500 and about 1641. The other question is when the British first came to Belize. We know they were in Nicaragua, uh, at Providence Island in the 1630s, and they were in Belize by the 1670s. But we don't know if they, I think there's a good chance they were there earlier because they combed the coast a lot, but, but we don't know. Now I try, I wanted to show you uh, the hundreds of Maya communities that existed in the contact period, but this is my map. Uh, and I know you can't read the names, but if you just see the bunches of names, there's some missing from the interior because uh, not as much is known. There were communities there, but not as much is known about that period, but it was a fairly populated um, area. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the term Maya, although it is used today, was not a term the Maya used to identify themselves. And uh, Matthew Restall has done quite a bit of work on this. He's a historian, ethno-historian. And he, one of his books, he talks, he, he explored he, Yucatecan documents, a Maya uh, documents at, uh, after the conquest in Yucatec. And uh, learned, we learned a little bit as a result of his work, some important information actually, that the Maya identified themselves by their community, their ka is what it's called. Uh, and it kind of combines the sense of community and, and home. So they would identify by where they, where they came from. Uh, and they also, the Chibal is also kind of a family name. And these names here, Kanul, Chel, Shu, Pech, they still exist today in, in Yucatan and Patan and Belize. And in fact, I had Chels and Shoes and Peches and, uh, working with me at, at Tipu. So those um, lineage names have survived. Uh, and I'm mentioning this because it will all affect um, the, our interpretation of, of this particular period. Now, Ralph Royce was someone who did fantastic work on the Spanish documents. And he had proposed that there existed provinces at the time of the conquest. But um, I think I've mentioned to you before that the Maya um, were really controlled resources more than territory. So these lines that, that were drawn here by the Spanish 
actually represent the situation that existed at the time that they encountered Yucatecans. But those lines could change every year because the taxes that came in to the, to the person, let's say the lord, who is the most powerful in the region, the taxes or the tribute that came into that lord came in as a result of someone owed him those taxes and tribute, which could come either from a marriage where a lord had married a woman from a powerful community so that she brought her rights to tribute with her. So she and her husband would then be able to extract um, tributes. That we don't know. It could be uh, products of corn. It could be um, material goods. Uh, could be trade goods. Uh, could be perhaps the, the use of certain scribes. But they didn't own the land. They didn't have access to the land that those people were from. They just had access to the resources. So this means that the idea of a province with lines around it is a bit iffy. <laughs> because it would change every year. And I mentioned uh, Subasa Okoshi and Sergio Quesada, uh, scholars in Mexico who have done lots more work on the documents and are, sh are showing that this idea of provinces was really, really fictional, given the economic system at the time. Uh, so from what I'm going to say from now on, I'm responsible for the archaeological interpretation because I excavated in these communities as well as the churches. But I relied a lot on... Um, Grant Jones's books. He wrote two, one on Belize and one on the Maya of Paten. And uh, because he worked on documents that had uh, in information on this period in these areas. So Tipu, this is a photograph of the pasture where we worked. The, in the foreground there is the uh, excavations of the church. And really the only reason that the ruins were found uh, Eric Thompson also worked, he was an amazing guy, he also worked on ethno-historic documents, and he was interested in what communities existed when the Spanish came. And so he did some work in the documents to try to propose where these mission communities were, because the Spaniards would, well, it was actually the Franciscans, visit these areas, build a church, try to con convert the Maya. And um, there, was, there was a community um, on the Macau River that he was able to locate called Tipu. We didn't know, he didn't know if it was on the western bank or the eastern bank. Where we ultimately excavated was the western bank, but he had kind of noted the area. So Grant Jones and my husband decided that they were going to try to find Tipu. And uh, it was when I was, I was commissioner, because I remember them coming into the office and saying they were go going off to find Tipu. And uh, because the area had been cleared for pasture, uh, they were, you know, they were able to locate these low, very low mounds, and they they hypothesized that that might be the community of Tipu. Ultimately, it turned out uh, to be true. Um, but it's interesting that if, you know, I think if it was even the grass had grown a little bit higher, they they would might not have found the, the, these low structures. But they did, and it ultimately proved to be the community. Uh, the 16th century community when the church was discovered. Now, I wasn't excavating there at the time. It was Robert Couts, and this is a picture of the church uh, as they excavated it. Uh, it. This is the east, and you can see the walls. They were partial height walls, the nave, and uh, where the altar was. Now, uh, so Bob's excavations at Tipu took place from 1980 to 82, and then I took over in 84 to 87. Um, I included this uh, drawing to just try to give you some idea of, of the community itself, but it, it turns out I'm, it's incorrect as a result of, well, I wouldn't say as a result of my excavations, but it was done at a time when we didn't really know the full character of this building, for example, which was much larger. Uh, other, another archaeologist, I think it was Ranju Song, has discovered a other, another structure. So we have to do a little more work in the community. But at least that gives you a sort of vague idea of what it might have looked like. Uh, and one of the things we did was, or I did, was to try to reconstruct what the church that we continued to excavate would have looked like. And this is the result of me and the artist Louise Belanger, whose name should have been on here, and I don't know why it isn't, uh, and Claude... Um, Claude Belanger, they, they live in Devon, and Claude is an architect. And so 
and uh, my husband uh, David helped, but uh, we worked on the archaeological evidence and then reconstructing the church itself. And this, is, this I believe, is accurate. We found um, lower height walls, and, and you knew that because we got the collapse. And if you uh, imagined those stones standing straight, they would not have been a complete wall. They would have been partial height uh, with... Uh, wood in between. Uh, the, the doors were on the sides. And this area that would have formed the sanctuary existed just as you see now. It would have supported a, a portable altar, both Lamanai and Tipu. At that time, the priests or the Franciscans carried um, portable altars. They didn't leave them in, in those communities, so they would carry them in there. Um, and this wall was still partly there. And it was a full height wall in this room in the back. So it's really quite thrilling to me that we were able to put all this together at Tipu. And I think it was probably built between 1544 and 1550. But um, unlike Lamanai, it seems to have been continuously added to, repaired, because it was in pretty good shape, whereas Lamanai churches were not. Uh, some of the excavations we did in the interior, I originally thought that this might represent apostasy and that they were building a pre-Columbian uh, altar. But no, I think <laughs> I, it turns out that it's probably um, support for, for some interior church, church furniture, a niche for a statue or something like that. Um, one of the things that were, was found at both Lamanai and Tipu are lots and lots of burials within the nave of the church. At Lamanai total, I think, was only about 130, but at Tipu, there were almost 600. And uh, about 545 were colonial, some were earlier. And I, I might have the numbers slightly wrong, but um, Mark Cohen, who was then at State University of New York at Plattsburgh, this was his plan, and he and his uh, students worked on excavating these, these burials. It's quite amazing. And uh, the collection is now in the, at the University of Southern Mississippi where Marie Danforth and her students are doing many different studies on the diet and health of, of the population. Um, so you can see there were burials within the church to the north, to the south, and to the west, but none on the east. And I don't know whether that was a practice in Europe at the time. Uh, the burials themselves, People were laid with their head to the west, facing, facing the east. And these are some of the, the burial pictures. They are Christian burials, so in a way I don't, well, I'm part of the Christian tradition. But you can see they're very well preserved. Um, they were buried with the jewelry. There's earrings here, the, uh, silver earring. Uh, jet was from Spain. Uh, and most of them were built were buried, that was Christian fashion, as I said, head to the west, facing east. They probably had shrouds that were fastened by these pins, uh, largely copper, but some of them alloys. And they were interesting, because there were a couple of, just, well, one was in a jar, but this burial is pre-Columbian style. But the interesting thing is that it had, he had two bracelets. One was spondylus shell, which was a popular pre-Columbian kind of jewelry, and the other was Venetian glass glass beads from Italy. So it's interesting that it spans the, the pre-Columbian and historic period. And just to give you an idea of, of some of the artifacts that came from Tipu, uh, we do have earlier post-classic material, late post-classic material that's actually connected to Lam and I. Uh, this was a cache in the colonial period, so in a colonial building, someone cached uh, the, the little face on the primary axis, which was a pre-Columbian custom, but it was during the colonial period. And this is, I think, my favorite artifact of, of I didn't excavate it, Mark did, Mark Cohen, but it's my favorite artifact. It was with someone in the church, not necessarily that close to the, the altar, if I remember. Uh, Mark said it was an adolescent. So uh, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, probably a boy, but, and it's a thurible. It's the equivalent of what is used to burn incense and spread it, you know, through the church. So to me, it's a very touching example of, you know, local pottery, but a European um, form and function. And we even got material like this fellow from a censor that dates to the 18th century. Um, Interesting metal artifacts as well. Copper axes were found only at Lamanai, and there are um, Dorothy Hostler and has done analysis of all of the material from Lamanai, and 
Brian Cockrell from Tipu. And it, it's interesting because uh, we say copper, but actually many of the bells and needles uh, and jewelry uh, w were uh, alloyed. So sometimes it was brass, sometimes it was bronze, and silver was also used. Uh, I think both Brian and uh, Dorothy uh, think that the Maya were t re uh, casting some Euro you know, European metals. And that may have, um, although we, we do know that in West Mexico, they did, they did use alloys. So it's, it's a complicated picture. Um, the uh, gold clasp for a book was from Lamanai. Both sides had myolica potter, pottery, uh, early myolica pottery. Uh, these kinds of bargueño locks from big Spanish chests. We got two at Tipu in the burials. And uh, I think, yeah, David got some Barguena locks as well. And the, the almost ubiquitous olive jars uh, that came from Europe, came from Spain, uh, used to store olive oil, but had multi-purposes in the, in the New World. So uh, when I was working at Lamanai, I worked, well, I worked there from 1998 to the present. My husband, 1974 to 86. And uh, he, was, he was the first to start to excavate the churches. And at Lamanai, this, just to show you that unlike many of the inland sites, Lamanai is spread out along the, the lagoon. And um, this the classic area, well, pre-classic, classic here. And if you see this little tiny square here, and that's what's here, kind of funny shape, uh, the historic community was south of that here. And this, this is where the churches were, and the community itself was a little bit farther to, to the west, the colonial community. And this is a plan of um, the churches at Lamanai, where the ones, as I said, that my husband started the excavation. I worked mostly on uh, the rec what I call the rectory. Uh, Claude Belanger was excavating there in 2007, 2008, and he was finally able to uh, locate the nave. It was a wooden nave, a masonry, um, I call it a chapel, the masonry east end of the church. But he found the post holes that would have supported the roof of a wooden nave. Uh, there was a little platform that we reckon must have either supported a holy water font or a statue or something. Uh, and there were a uh, big center posts as well. And this one had a cache. So it's interesting, while they were building the Christian churches, the Maya made sure that there were... Um, deposits, uh, uh, pre-Columbian style deposits. Um, the first church you can see is a little wonky and uh, Claude uh, in excavating, you could, you, they apparently built it in sections and you could see there were errors and he, he thinks that probably the, the friar was directing even though the Maya probably knew exactly what to do but uh, was, was thrown a bit off, off killed her I suppose by and, and also the placement of the church is a little weird because the soil is very soft here and if the Maya were going to build it they wouldn't bother to put the east end in, in that, uh, the, that kind of soil so it's kind of, kind of interesting um, I think it was built in 1543 1544 because there is our records of Franciscan tra going through a Belize um, to Yucatan at this time and, and proselytizing. Now, we call this a primitive church design, and this is because in my research, I, and also with the help of George Kubler, who was an early art historian, apparently in the 13th, 12th, 13th century in France, to combat um, apostasy, the Dominicans and then the Franciscans made a really concerted effort to... Uh, reintegrate the people who were um, interpreting the Christian doctrine in a different way. And uh, they, just, they decided to go back to a more primitive kind of church, very simple. Well, you know, St. You know, Francis was a, uh, one of the leaders in this, this uh, movement of simplifying. And uh, their churches had an apsidal, this very simple, narrow design, an apsidal ends. So uh, through that, I was able to tell Grant, because Grant thought that there were secular priests who, was, who were doing the conversion. But with, when you see this church, you know it was the Franciscans. It was a Franciscan-style primitive church. Um, so it was very, really exciting. Uh, the atrio is, is the area where they would often proselytize or teach the children. They did this in central Mexico as well, in the plaza, these huge areas the children would line up and they would teach them the catechism. 
Um, and these are the remains, photographs of the remains of the first church. Here you can see uh, the support for the walls and the, uh, it was built over a post-classic temple. They raised the temple and they put the church <laughs> on top of it. David calls it Iglesia de la Manai I. Um, and I should have included this picture too, but these are some of the burials in the first church. And uh, most were buried with the head to the west, face to the east, which would have been the style at that time. But there turned out to be other burials the other way. And it's interesting because when David started at Lamanai, there were two Maya men living there and farming. And one of them, Don Pastor, because there used to be Maya villages there, but they were kicked out by the British. Um, Don Pastor said that when the village was there, they used to bury people in this mound. He had no idea it had been a church, right? But that's where they used to bury their dead, which is fascinating because it does suggest some collective, collective memory. Uh, this is a view of the second uh, church. This is what I call the chapel, and the nave would have extended to the west. And here you can see the, the post-classic style temple that was completely covered by the, the, you know, the first church. It was quite a statement, I think. And there's the, the, the atrio in real life. And it matches Spanish patterns because there's, they usually, the Spanish put something in the, in the center of the atrio, either a, a statue or something. And it's clear that they had erected something here. Uh, but all we had was, were the, the line of the, uh, of the feature. Now, the interesting thing is that in both churches, we do have pre-Columbian caches, um, which the Spaniards interpreted as apostasy, right? That they were re revolting against Christian re religion. Um, and that's, that's what I'll talk a little bit about. These are what some of the caches look like. They're effigy figures, usually crocodile mixed with a land, a, a, a land creature, deer, or sometimes it's crocodile mixed with shark. Um, Several of them have, well, the mouth open with the head emerging, which is a very old Maya symbol. It was a symbol in the classic period, and the rulers will have headdresses of a, often of a crocodilian, sometimes a bird creature with the ruler's head in the mouth. And it, um, I think it's a sign of kingship, the, 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 the symbol that the, the ruler was kind of able to access both worlds. You know, it had nothing to do with the creature eating a human, which I have read. It had to do with the symbolism of, uh, of particular people being able to uh, communicate with the other world and the world of people. So that, it's interesting that that theme continues into the post-classic, and we see it manifested in these various effigy figures. My favorite is one I call the Tingler. And this was discovered at 2007, 2008 by Claude. I came shortly a afterwards. And um, it's really a, a centipede. Steve Houston has, has claimed in a book he did with Dan Finnemore that it was a lobster. I think there are lobster traits, like the segmentation. But these features here, the sort of, I don't know what you would call them, antennae coming out of the mouth, the many legs, and the forked um, tail are all very uh, millipede, centip centipede. Uh, and inside were uh, arrow points and shark, two arrow points, shark teeth, and a stingray spine. Stingray spine was often used for bloodletting. So, and this is my re our reconstruction of the first church at Lamanai. It's very it's similar to the second church, but not as well made. It was still built on a pre-Columbian style platform, which gets abandoned later on. Uh, Claude said that you could tell it was repeatedly shored at the, at the east end because it just wasn't a good foundation. Um, oh, and here I did include, uh, Louise did the drawing, and of course, Claude, um, is the architect, and then I stood by. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I had read all, all of the excavation uh, material and also did, did a little bit of work on this church. I did more at Tipu, but uh, I think we have pretty good evidence. Tipu had definitely had higher walls. Uh, this church was a little flakier, uh, but it was still a, you know, the style of the primitive church. 
And then the second church at Lamanai, this is the reconstruction. We don't know what the top looked like, but this style of first church was all over Yucatan. And so we, we copied uh, one of the similar churches in Yucatan. And I, originally my husband thought it was built in the 17th century, but I think by then relations with the Spanish had declined and, and there, was a, there was quite a big effort in the 1560s to redraw the, the communities in Belize into the fold. And I think that probably, and it also tells us that they planned for the, the Franciscans planned for the Lamanai community to be part of, of Yucatan, the whole uh, Christian community in Yucatan, because that's quite a big effort. Uh, but, it, but it didn't happen. Even when the church, the church walls collapsed, and the burial, there were burials in the cemetery that cut through the collapse, cut through um, the later buildings which suggested that they continue to, you know, to bury people in the cemetery even after the church had collapsed. What's go, you know, what's going on? How, how is that uh, reflective of a community that was rejecting Christianity if they were continuing to bury people in the cemetery? So it got me to look at things in a slightly different way. And then also I went to Tulane, Tulane University to, to look at some... Uh, documents to try to figure out if the friars or recorded any of the material culture, you know, so that I could learn more about what material had been brought to the church, the altars, the mensas. And uh, I came across this uh, catechism that was written by um, a friar, a, a Dominican who had worked in the Caribbean in the early period, and it was later used by the Aztecs. And darned if it wasn't exactly what I had been taught in catechism in Patterson, New Jersey. The imagery of God the, sitting on a throne with the angels. I, I, I had goosebumps when I read it because I thought, do I share you know, something with the Aztecs and the Maya? Having had that story told to me when um, I, I went to catechism. And it just, I don't know, it just blew my mind. And so I, I, I guess I started to look at, at things differently. And it, it's true that in the cemetery at Tipu, there aren't as many burials at, at Lamanai, and they're not that well preserved. Um, that many, not all, but much of the jewelry is found with children. And I often, I wondered if, because when we learned the catechism, we used to get little rewards. Usually it was a little holy picture, you know, we didn't get rosary beads or anything like that. But we just got little pictures and things. Oh, Elizabeth, you've, you've recited the catechism so well. So I don't know, I wondered if they were, they were related. to They could be, I can't prove it. But it is interesting that children um, seem to monopolize these. Uh, there's Venetian glass beads, there's a gilded, uh, in, in the center there, that's a jet. There's quite a bit of jet, amber. And here's the jet bead necklace. We restrung it. Those were obviously loose in the soil, but that was our reconstruction. Silver earring, jet pendant. So was it a veneer? I mean, when you're a child, as we were, and you learn that those things, you're, you're not analyzing it. You're just absorbing it. So the idea that um, Christianity was a veneer, I think, is a little bit too simplistic. Okay. Um, then, you know, were the Maya being deceptive? And was it an authentic Christianity? Well, th this really, I think, is uh, interesting because, I'll tell you in a minute, did religion drive the rebellion? Well, I don't think it did. But So I think that when the Maya said they were Christian, you just have to go with it. And that they, I think they saw their traditions and rituals as expressing rather than contradicting the Christian worldview. And I'll tell you why I say this in a minute. Um, and also, the effigies that, that they buried, as I just told you, they were buried in Christian sacred space. Okay. They made it sure by an altar, you know, by the axis. So it, it seemed to me to be a, a bit more complicated. And when I read about the Christianization of Europe, the interesting thing, remember I mentioned to you about the days of the week? I, I guess the Christian proselytizers never got the Germans or the English or <laughs> Scandinavians to change the, the naming the days after God. So, and also, there are so many customs that are incorporated into Catholic, what we now call Catholicism. Uh, blessing yourself, kneeling, holy water. I could think of ashes. That's all pre-Christian. 
pre-Christian, <laughs> okay? It was absorbed into the Christianity as it sort of rolled across Europe because uh, in order to win converts, uh, they had to accept some of the, pre many of the Germanic customs uh, were, were uh, incorporated into Christianity. So I began to see that, wait a minute, just because the Maya incorporated some pre-Columbian practices, why does that make, why is that different? Why can the Europeans do it, but the Maya can't? And I think it's because the friars forgot, <laughs> you know? That's what they did. They used all of those kneeling and, you know, whatever else we were taught, holy water. And they, they think that that's, you know, that's it. That's, that's Catholicism. That's Christianity. They don't think, well, wait a minute. This was pre-Christian. So if I'm doing this, what the Maya are doing, isn't that kind of like the same? No, no, they didn't. They didn't think that way. Um, so that that was one thing that that got me thinking. And also, the, well, the importance of sacred space. I could go on for this forever. So why did the authorities assume apostasy and deception? This really interested me. We, we had a, a Franciscan monastery in Patterson when I was little. It was my favorite place to go. I have, again, a kind of love-hate relationship with the Franciscans. But um, I was fascinated when I was a child with... Uh, with the monastery. And, but they assumed whenever things went the way they didn't think it should go, that the Maya were being apostate or deceptive or mean or lying. And one of the things that they did was to interpret much of the uh, imagery, Maya imagery, as uh, works of the devil, uh, as apostasy, as idolatry, right? And, and one of the things that's interesting, they interpreted their imagery metaphorically but they interpreted Maya imagery literally. Big difference. Now, when I say metaphorically, if I look at a picture of St. Dominic here, I, don't, I know that he didn't walk around with a yellow metal thing around his head. I know that that symbolizes holiness. Okay? I know that he didn't walk around with a dog that had torch in his mouth all the time. He didn't have the path to his house with this big globe thing. No. <laughs> Those are all stories about his life, the flowers, the, what he's carrying. Same with uh, Mary here on the right, Blessed Virgin Mary. I don't think she had lasers, you know, shot lasers from her hand. That represents her, her I think, her not just her power, but her goodness. And my favorite is the sacred heart, you know, the heart just sticking out of the chest. I, I don't think she was that abnormal. I think her heart was where everybody else's heart was. Okay. That, it's a symbol. And on the upper left, that's an uh, early period in, in Spain. I don't believe that people, Christ, um, creatures like that ever existed. That's a whole thing about the evil, evil people and how they're going to be dragged into hell by demons. But when the Spanish read Maya imagery, they didn't make that, you know, they didn't uh, sort of look at it in that way. It would be like saying that because we go, people who go to church and there's a little crash there with a lamb and you know ox that that were worshiping cattle and you know but no that's a story <laughs> it's a story <laughs> okay so and the other other things i found was really interesting jimmy you can correct me <laughs> after a while but um they brought visual baggage that was rooted in european culture now one of the things in europe at that time that was considered sort of not, not so much well evil but a place where a bad air spirits and everything were orifices and um, here you have one of Bruegel's paintings um, where you know there's or, or, evil things are coming out of rear ends and mouths and look at this I mean it's amazing and it's it's this idea that orifices were yeah I guess you could say were evil they were dangerous evil places um, I drew this from various paintings obviously but from the garden of earthly delights of a Bosch uh, people are being eaten and swallowed, um, and the descent into limbo. There, I guess there was, there is a belief that Jesus, when he rises again, will have to go to limbo or somewhere to bring out the souls and save them, and that's always represented by a huge maw, which is kind of scary. So they would have brought that with them to the Maya area, where just the opposite is true, right? The mouth is. Again, with the head in it, the symbol of rulership, uh, the buildings that have mouths and openings, it, it represents uh, a portal, you know, from today, from 
the everyday world to the spiritual world. It's a positive symbol. It's a sacred symbol, like, like the, the openings to caves. And, and the, so that, that's one, the open mouth, that must have, <laughs> they, they, the friars must have had, uh, well, problems, you know, looking at Maya imagery and then interpreting it in a, in a European mindset. But also I found that um, shells, with, sometimes with people emerging, was also associated with hell. And the, you know, the floor of hell is littered with, with shells. I don't know why, <laughs> but, but it is. And... Um, of course, in the Maya area, sorry, it's just the opposite. <laughs> the shell, too, represents a, a, a kind of portal between this world and the next, the spiritual world that's positive when you see uh, anthropomorphic figures associated with shells. This is actually from Laminoi. So there were a huge number of misunderstandings, which never ceases to sadden me, I think in which I think could have been a much richer, you know, cultural exchange. Uh, but the effort just wasn't made on the part of the Franciscans. Um, and I say the Franciscans because they were instrumental in Yucatan and Belize. They were later supplanted by secular clergy, but the, the uh, Jesuits never had... Well, the Jesuits later came to Belize in the educational system, but early on it was really the Franciscans. And I, I think the Dominicans, Augustinians, operated in Mexico, but not Yucatan and Belize. Not the, the Dominicans did come into Gua, from Guatemala into southern Belize. There was some activity there, but nothing like what the initial Franciscan uh, effort in Yucatan and Belize. So I still... Uh, I guess it still fascinates me. I wanted to end with one of my favorite artifacts, which, unlike most of the other ones I showed you, which are from our excavations, uh, we don't know where this, this was excavated, but it's uh, in the collections of the National Museum of Mexico, and Michel Zabel gave me permission to, uh, to use it. And I just think it's, it's lov lovely, <laughs> the man coming from the shell with a smile on his face, you know, sort of... Uh, depicting uh, the positive, that is a positive image. Um, so that's really all, all I have to say. I like to end with this painting by Gustave Doré of the triumph of Christianity over paganism because, again, what represents paganism is, is imagery from pre-Christian cultures. You know, uh, what is shown as wrong is the imagery from pre-Christian cultures cultures. Um, and incidentally, this is a slide of the real painting because Joseph uh, Tannenbaum is, is Canadian and I met him in Toronto and uh, he gave me permission to use, but to use the picture of his painting. But of course you find it on the web all over the place. So, but um, anyway, that's, that's all I have to say about that. And I just hope that it might give you a, a different idea of, of the conquest and it's uh, its result. I have to admit that I think some of my colleagues, I, I don't know, I don't know how they really reacted to the book, to me giving a slightly a different take on, on you know, Christianity. But I, I think that as when I was a child, you, you don't think this is religion, this is not religion, this is Christian, this is not Christian. You absorb ideas, and I think that we have to credit the Maya as being able to think for themselves. And the scenarios and the causality that I felt like we found that existed in archaeology was really too, too sim simplistic. And so I think the, re the idea of resistance is true. There was, but it isn't just res, you know a resistance against a religion. It's, it was much more complicated. And in fact, in the case of the Maya and Belize, they were tired of being taxed by the people who lived in Bacalar. So, anyway, that's.